Thomas Green here with Ethical Marketing Service. On the episode today, we have Daniel Alphon. Daniel, welcome. Thank you very much, Thomas. I'm glad to be part of the podcast. Glad to have you. Would you like to take a moment and tell the audience a bit about yourself and what you do? It's a pleasure. Uh, my name is Daniel Alphon. I'm a LinkedIn specialist. I joined LinkedIn in 2004, and I help people use it to leverage, leverage LinkedIn uh, better entrepreneurs, consultants, coaches, and executives. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, there's, uh, I've got tons of um, tons of thing, uh, things I want to ask you about LinkedIn. Um, but when someone finds out what you do, uh, what's the first thing that you lead with in terms of, um, should we say, best bits that you would tell someone? Many people are on LinkedIn and don't ask themselves basic questions about what they like to get from the platform. And that's my first piece of, of advice. Are you interested in creating thought leadership? Are you interested in clients? Are you interested in promotion? When you know the answer to that question, it's a lot easier to leverage the platform. So you need to have clear goals first. Um, I, I can. I, I am guilty of perhaps um, going on platforms specifically because I feel like I have to, rather than saying, "What's the what's the thing I want to get from this?" Um, why are you on LinkedIn? The invitation I got back then was from someone I trusted, and I think networking and trust are, are um, key in the way I uh, perceive LinkedIn. It's uh, one of the top results whenever someone Googles your name and if you use it strategically, you could network pre-COVID, post-COVID, and it's a very powerful business tool. There's a couple of things that I wanted to follow up on there because there were questions that I did want to ask you. The first thing was in regards to uh, when you first joined, which is 2004. I was going to say, um, when did you start thinking that you were gonna, for example, make a living from LinkedIn? So you've been on there for for so long, but when did you think, okay, I can help people with this? Certainly not in 2004, <laughs> truth to be told. Um, I think by 2006, I started using LinkedIn in order to cut my sales cycle. I was selling, I was a salesperson and LinkedIn enabled me to shorten the sales cycle simply because I knew the name of the uh, distributor I wanted to reach in North America. And then I started helping friends. And those friends became entrepreneurs themselves and they asked me to train their sales force. And at one point I realized this has become a significant part of my revenues and I decided to specialize, if you'd like. Social was becoming too big. And LinkedIn was a conservative uh, and professional network. And it, in, in a way, it has stayed uh, the same. So I morphed into, into this and suddenly woke up realizing that this has become my, uh, like I, ha I had the best job in the world without realizing it. That's cool. Um, and you also mentioned in your answer about networking. One of the things I wanted to ask you about is, um, has LinkedIn replaced networking? What I would say is that LinkedIn enhances your real life networking. And I wouldn't use the word replace. It's too tempting to think that LinkedIn has replaced networking, but networking is far more important than LinkedIn. There's, there are people you met in real life, people you served, people you worked with, and some of those people are on LinkedIn. Um, I was listening to uh, to an episode you, uh, you released with uh, Ryan uh, Warner, and he mentioned that before he, he discovered LinkedIn and, and saw that everyone and their brother was a, a consultant uh, and a coach, <laughs> his business was strictly based on referrals. And so, so is mine. And the way I leverage LinkedIn is simply by connecting to people I know well, and then whenever I run a search, or whenever it looks me up and we share a mutual connection, then I could ask that person for an introduction. So we have to make a choice. It's not a popularity contest. You can ask yourself what's right for me and not necessarily what's popular. 
Well, that kind of goes straight into the um, the connections question of uh, should I get 500 plus connections or should I um, say yes to everyone that connects with me? What's your take on on that approach? What is your take, Thomas? First. I think that your position would be that you should connect with people who are, as you say, it's not a popularity contest. So you should um, connect with people who you know or have the potential to do business with you. Um, but based on what your first uh, answer was today with regards to your goals, I would say it depends on what your goals are. So if you're trying to look like a big influencer, you may want to connect with tons and tons of people, um, regardless of whether they're going to do anything with you. Um, or if you're, uh, if you're specifically going on there for sales, then there's no point in connecting with people who are never going to be your customer. So I've asked you a question and then I've answered it for you. I feel somewhat <laughs> narcissistic by this. Well, I think your answer uh, is great and, and probably better than the way I would uh, phrase it. Just asking ourselves what we'd like to get from LinkedIn is, is half the, the trouble. Um, you have to basically pick either quality, trust, or exposure, quantity. And naturally, Thomas, most people want both. And the sad truth is that when you aim for both, you often end up having very little of either. Because one, 500 plus or even 3,000 is not a large enough quantity to get exposure on LinkedIn because most of our connections will not see the stuff we share on LinkedIn. Most of our connections visit LinkedIn occasionally, and that means only a few of them will ever notice what is it you share. So if you do have 30,000 connections, then that could mean exposure. But if you're, you don't have 30K, then stick with people you know. Because if you have 499 and you're waiting for some magic to happen when the 500 plus appears, I'm sorry to break it to you, nothing will happen. West Sussex will, will not become uh, a different place and uh, Tel Aviv is not going to be different when you reach 500 plus. Have you got any um, stats or has anyone asked you about the fact that um, when I post something out, what percentage of people see it? Have you got any thoughts on that? Uh, LinkedIn hardly um, discloses any uh, anything about the algorithm or, or uh, the numbers. I would actually advise our, our audience here not to pay too much attention to what LinkedIn calls views. So when you share something, the number of views is inflated because if you go to your home uh, to your home page on LinkedIn and you scroll, what anything that was there is counted as a view whether you actually viewed it or not. And the metrics, I think, make more sense to follow are the comments, the shares, and the likes. Or people reaching out to you saying, you know, I, re I read what you uh, shared and uh, I have this to ask you. This is something I would like to mention. But the views is highly inflated. It's a vanity metric. And I wouldn't count too much on that number. The, the last thing to, to, to mention about this is that Pre-COVID, the uh, average time people spent on LinkedIn was 70 minutes a month, which is nothing compared with Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or other channels. And that's the main reason why people will not see the stuff that you share. It's not that they don't want to, but there is often a real life trigger. You, someone sent them an invitation and then they may accept the invitation and check LinkedIn for a minute. They want to, to, to see who Thomas Green, in, Green is, and they will check you out on LinkedIn. But chances are they will not see what you share because that will not happen 30 seconds after you shared it. So it's few, two to 5%, if I uh, had to, to pick or, or to give an estimate, not more than two or 5%, unless many people comment on, on it and it becomes sort of viral, if you'd like. Have you ever, or do you frequently get the, how often should you post question? <laughs> yes, and let me, uh, let me see if you can provide with a better answer than mine uh, for the second time. What is your opinion on that? Uh, is it gonna be based on your goals again? 
So, um, and uh, quality versus quantity. So are you the type of person who wants to only put out quality or do you just want to always be seen so you should put out uh, quantity all the time? But what happens is that when you go to your homepage and say you scroll, scroll down, you will never see someone mentioned more than once. So what happens is that if you were to share something on Tuesday and you were to share something else on Wednesday and Thursday, those two last posts are going to cannibalize the first. You will not be seen more times. Your shares are going simply to be distributed between the first share and the second share and the third share. And if I can uh, suggest a quick way of, of thinking about this, ask yourself, why are we sharing? Why do I have to share this? And is it relevant for my audience? Is it relevant for my connections? If you want to be seen as a thought leader, there are many other ways to share content on LinkedIn without leaning on your connections too heavily. There are LinkedIn communities, LinkedIn groups. Going there and share interesting articles about ethics may be more relevant and may bring you more leads than sharing it with your own connections who may have worked with you, or maybe you provided Google ad services to them, but they're, they're not necessarily interested in that specific content. Most people are not that interested in seeing what we share. So the quick answer, less than we think. Do you think there's an awful lot of unfollowing going on then? I think there's a lot of um, uh, blind blindness we, we, we develop when we know that that person shares the same sort of content, then we become almost blind to it. And we don't check it out because we, we anticipate, we understand that it's a system and they keep sharing the same things. And at one point it becomes less relevant. And you, you're right, some, in, in some cases, if uh, you feel that someone has uh, hijacked your feed, then you may, you could disconnect or unfollow that person. So think twice before sharing. Interesting. Um, just coming back to networking for a moment, I've got the, the good phrase here, which is the good, the bad, and the ugly. What springs to mind for you there? Um, you have a real life reputation. And if you, Consider the way you network on LinkedIn and in real life and the way you build your presence on LinkedIn, your profile, your page. I could think or, or suggest three, three questions you could ask yourself. First question is, am I happy with what I'm doing on that social platform? Am I happy with sharing this? Am I happy with having that headline and that description, that photo or that banner? The second question you could ask is, when people who know me see what I'm doing here, are they likely to be surprised or will they not and say, yes, Thomas Green is exactly like that, but he's aligned with the way I know him as a person. And the less friction there is, the better it is for you. Because if people sense that you're faking it, then you, your reputation is might be hurt. Your real life reputation, you've worked decades to, to, to earn it. And the third and last question, your ideal prospects were looking for someone with your skill set, but have never heard of you. What are they going to think when they see the stuff that you share and the way you built your profile? If you manage to answer all three questions in a good way, you're happy with it. Your network, see, it's aligned with you as a person and people who you want to work with when they see what you do, their only question is, how do I get hold of that Thomas Green as soon as possible? Try to think about all three questions and then you're good. Interesting. And um, have you answered those questions for yourself? I tried. Um, and, and I even asked um, other people to, uh, to give me some feedback because we're not necessarily the best uh, judges uh, for ourselves. And I've... Um, um, changed things that uh, I thought were uh, 
uh, interesting and, and uh, some, some, people, some of the people I trust told me they didn't appreciate it and, and they explained why. And I did find, find a way to have something I'm happy with. I can sleep at night having this, but it also better aligned with the way they perceive me as a person. And you should always ask yourself that question. And what um what are the what are your goals for for LinkedIn? For, for the company? Uh, just from from your LinkedIn activity, what do you want to get from the platform? Um, leaders who want to leverage LinkedIn themselves or train their uh, their organization, their staff, is the sort of prospects and, and clients I'm looking for, and. LinkedIn has enabled me to, to help people uh, leverage the platform. And um, since my business is based on referrals, when you read the content I share on LinkedIn or when you read the way I, I um, wrote or created my profile, you, you could have a good idea of, is that person someone I could benefit from, I could work with or not? And all our listeners here could simply ask themselves two questions. Who's my ideal prospect? And what action would I like those people to perform when they visit my profile? And if their answer, Thomas, is reach out to me, then ask yourself, have I provided the information that is likely to turn a stranger into someone interested in working with me or reaching out to me? And in many cases, they have that content but sadly, it's not reflected on LinkedIn. You don't have to create that content. You just have to use it on LinkedIn and try to build a converting profile. So a selfish question here. I know it probably wouldn't take you very long to establish a good quote unquote LinkedIn profile from a bad one. I saw that I got a no notification that you did check out the profile. How am I doing? Doing great. Doing great because whenever uh, someone visits your profile, they're bound to see it. The first thing they're, they're going to see is the banner. And you have a banner that has the same photo and the book and the Google uh, partner uh, text here and all sorts of logos that we see on, on, on the left. So it, the first, the, the fact that you created a banner already stands out from most LinkedIn users. And the banner, I think, is aligned, and I like the way you uh, you look uh, you look up in uh, in the photo itself. The second thing that's most important in terms of, of text is the headline. And most people would the, the default uh, headline would be uh, director, um, ethical marketing service. But instead of that, you changed it and tweaked it into improving client businesses through digital marketing expertise. And then director ethical marketing services service, and lastly, Google Ads partner and author. So I think you managed to pack a lot of interesting information into the headline. And I can't stress this enough, the headline is the most important real estate we have on our LinkedIn profile. Since the banner, both the banner and the headline do the trick. Now most people are likely to scroll down, see the about section, see the post you featured on your profile, scroll down to see the activity and end up in the uh, experience uh, section, the education and the recommendation. There are many people who could um, look at your profile and adopt and get inspired and, and improve their own. Thank you. I feel better. I feel um, a sense of worth now from that, uh, from your expertise saying that I've done well. Um, you, you touched on something which um, is about the fact that I'm a business owner. Um, and do you uh, differentiate between normal people um, using LinkedIn, like employees, for example? I say normal people. I don't know why I said that. Um, and people who are business owners. 
their needs may differ, uh, but it's like learning to, to drive, if you'd like. So the, the business owners are, are interested in leads and the employee uh, it may be interested in promotion or finding a better position. The way they will use the, the, the engine or the car is different, but it, it would work in the same way. Who's your ideal reader? If you're uh, an employee, then your ideal reader may be the next hiring manager you'd like to work with. Okay, if you're a QA manager, then maybe the hiring manager will be head of QA or VP R&D at a company. If you're chief operation officer, maybe the hiring manager is the, is the CEO. When, you're, when you have a business, then your ideal reader on LinkedIn becomes your prospect. Who would I like to serve? Mm. What is their position? Where are they best? Wait, based. And thinking about that ideal prospect and your ideal reader on LinkedIn is the first step into a converting profile. Comes back to your three things that you mentioned initially about who's it for and what your goals are. Exactly. Um, I before we um, started the call, I checked out the website. And um, there was a cool little uh, video, um, just a short one, maybe a minute, minute long or something, where you do a screen share. Um, do you mind sharing um, for people who haven't seen it what, what that's about? The screen share with replying to LinkedIn invitation, or is it the something else? A request, yeah. yeah. Excellent. So when, when you uh, visit the My Network tab, the second from left in the LinkedIn homepage, you could uh, see all incoming invitations. And if you look at the top right, LinkedIn will tell you, see all three invitations, see all five invitations. When you click there, you will see a message that enables you to send a reply to whoever it was this, that sent you a, Thomas, a LinkedIn uh, request. And that means you can reply to them without accepting their invitation. And one good way to uh, to do this is to simply say, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to join your network. I don't think we've met before. Can I be of help to you or your company? And if the person replies and says, yes, I, I would like you to help us with X, Y, and Z, then treat it like it was an email or phone call. Qualify that person and build a relationship, and maybe eventually you also connect with him or with her on LinkedIn. But you could treat the incoming invitations as opportunities, and maybe one out of ten would be intriguing enough for you to reply to. It will take you twenty seconds, and it's worth doing it. Yeah, that sounds very sensible. But I think um, when people use these platforms, they just kind of integrate into what the maybe what the norm is. Um, what do you think? more people don't do that particular action? Um, many of them can't see the message uh, option at all because it's LinkedIn, what LinkedIn shows us are, are basically two, two options, mm. accept or ignore. So naturally, um, they think they have to either to reject it or to accept. But under the hood, there are many possibilities there. And uh, um, if you manage to understand the power that LinkedIn has, it enables you to build a trustworthy net network, to become a thought leader, to network, to gain clients. If you do it in a systematic way, and, and the, the video you, you described is at the bottom of my, uh, of my website, and anyone can check it. it. It takes less than a minute to, to understand the whole thing. What's your opinion about the company in general? Um, if LinkedIn were doing a great job, I wouldn't have a business. And um, when you think of it, it's a platform that has close to 1 billion members and 90% of them may have no clue what they're there for, which is amazing when they are looking for a job then they understand maybe they understand what they want to get out of it but a minute they don't have any um, short-term objective they, they forget about it or don't get anything from it 
even when you don't look for a job, you could use LinkedIn, you could le leverage LinkedIn to nurture the relationships with people you know, or to strengthen your thought leadership. Because there will be a time down the road in <clears throat> two or three years, you could leverage that, that reputation. I got a really meaningful one for you now. You ready? Yes. How many connections do you have? <laughs> Less than a thousand. Really? Wow. I'm surprised by that. Um, surprised based on your time frame within within the platform, but also not surprised based on what you told me today about, you know, what am I here for? Yeah. Um whenever I, I reply to incoming invitations, like when I give a, a lecture, then many people end up sending me an invitation request. And I basically reply and say, it's not fair. Like you heard me for 90 minutes. I heard you maybe for 90 seconds. I, I can't vouch for you. I can't, even if someone asks me, I can't really help you. Maybe we could grab coffee pre-COVID. And most of those people don't reply. So if, um, if it's not important, if the relationship is not important enough for them to even decline, then I'd rather not do anything on LinkedIn. For me, the connection is the end of a process. Now, I, you could also do it completely differently. You could say that connection is the beginning of a process and have a system nurturing those people, and that's fine. Most people don't do either. They don't have a system, they accept randomly, they accept because they're looking for clients now, they're looking for a job, but maybe six downs down the road, they would, they, they would behave differently. So just think about your long-term plans and your long-term objectives and use LinkedIn in, do in order to help you achieve that. So would you say that you treat connections in a way that LinkedIn advises that you do? Because I know that the whole idea of connections, I think, from LinkedIn's perspective, is that it is your community, your network. It's an excellent question. LinkedIn has sort of uh, schizophrenic about it, if you like. Because whenever you send an invitation, LinkedIn will, sh the, the small, the fine print says, uh, connect with people you know well. But when you go to LinkedIn, the connect button is prominent whenever you run a search. And LinkedIn will encourage you to upload your address book from Gmail or Outlook or Yahoo and send hundreds, if not thousands of connection requests. Back at the day, it was, it may have, uh, the, the idea was to build a network and make more people aware of LinkedIn. But now it's, it has backfired for some people because if everyone is connected to everyone else, you no longer know whether they actually know each other in real life. And if your business is based on referrals and word of mouth, it's you that needs to call the shots, not other people and not LinkedIn. You do um, have one on your profile regarding the upside and the downside of connecting with people you don't know. You got anything to add there? Um, it's part of the seminars I run. I don't think it's part of uh, my profile, but very, very quickly, what, what, it, what we could say is this. You could leverage LinkedIn in a phenomenal way with 120 connections you know well, and you could have 5,000 connections and gain no revenues or promotions thanks to LinkedIn. Because what happens is that most people start with a quality approach. They start by connecting with people they know well. And then at one point, they think that they must get to the other side, to the quantity. But the problem is they never cross that bridge. They stop at 1,000, 2,000, 5,000. And even if they have 5,000 connections on LinkedIn, what, what has happened? When they share something, maybe 2% of those people will see it. So it's 100 people. That's not exposure. Hmm. And on the other hand, they have polluted the quality of their network. And they can no longer gain a meaningful introduction 
to their next client. Had they gone the whole way to 30K, they would have gotten a lot of exposure. Had they stayed with the quality, they could get referrals. But the, the center zone is, is the weakest place or the worst connection strategy out there. I would advise our listeners to pick a side for the long term. If, you don't, if you're not sure, think where would you like to be in terms of quality or quantity in three years time? Are you on the other social profiles on the social platforms? <laughs> um, I use Twitter to, uh, lot, I read a lot of stuff on Twitter and I use Quora and Quora is uh, maybe the best kept, uh, kept secret in town where you could um, read interesting answers about all sorts of topics and also highlight your, your expertise um, I provided one answer about a killer LinkedIn profile and uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to, for Quora to, um, to highlight it when they uh, enabled LinkedIn to um, uh, featured Quora content. So, so Quora itself uh, uh, featured my, uh, my Quora answer. I think Quora is, is an, interesting, uh, an interesting place to consume content, to learn, really to learn, and also to, to increase your thought leadership. But if you're not interested in that, just learn. It's a very powerful platform. And the, um, the future of LinkedIn, what do you see? When it was acquired by Microsoft, I was thinking maybe that's the beginning of the end. Um, but Microsoft has been very, acted very um, cleverly and, and um, we were very careful not to change the, the LinkedIn uh, DNA, not, not to change the LinkedIn uh, look and feel. Um, LinkedIn is, is still growing. Each second, two people sign up. It's, it's an amazing uh, stat. And the challenge the company faces in the long term, I ask myself every quarter, should I still provide should this should this be the center of my business or is LinkedIn in danger of disappearing? I don't think there will be a, a, some dark horse that uh, beats LinkedIn within two months. But if LinkedIn doesn't provide a good service to its users, us, then there may come a day with where specialized communities takes take bites out of LinkedIn, a community for doctors, a community for researchers, and each of those could provide a better service for, for um, their community. And LinkedIn should try to listen to its users a lot more than they do. In terms of your goals, would you like to share anything there? Uh, with pleasure. Um, I'm working on uh, an online course. I hope to uh, complete uh, later uh, this year in 2022. And I also uh, added uh, articles to, to my website and uh, digital downloads and, and a program to my, uh, to my store. And I look forward to uh, finding partners who could help me um, reach more people and help more people. And in terms of people you typically work with, um, what's the normal person that gets in touch with you who wants to hire you? be uh, entrepreneurs who want to uh, gain clients from LinkedIn. It's, uh, it's a significant uh, segment for me. Anyone who's typically I don't do um, introduction to LinkedIn courses, if you like. Most of people, most of the, the, my, the clients I work with have been on LinkedIn for years, but something happened in their life that made LinkedIn a lot more crucial for them. Uh, one type of uh, client would be a 40 plus uh, corporate refugee. People who have left corporate America or left uh, um, um, are no longer employees and start their own business. They could be solopreneurs, they could be consultants, they could be coaches, and their clientele is on LinkedIn. And the good news about it is that they have built some sort of network when they were employees. And now they don't need to dump it. They can 
leverage that platform and that network when they offer their new services. So this is a significant uh, portion of my clientele as well. And if people want to find, uh, hire you, um, where's the best place to find you? Other than LinkedIn, of course. <laughs> the best place is my website. That's danielalfon.com, A-L-F-O-N. I have um, um, long form articles there. Um, an email, I, a LinkedIn tip I send uh, typically once a month. And also uh, a giveaway, a uh, cheat sheet really about improving our, uh, our profile on LinkedIn, our headline profile. Any closing thoughts today? Um, again, in the uh, episode you had with uh, Ryan Warner, he said uh, that he uh, spoke with uh, the, the people who gave the, the pitches there and said, don't start with what you've been doing for the last couple of years, start with what they need. And I think that can apply to what our listeners and ourselves can do on LinkedIn, especially if we've moved away from being an employee and we have become consultants or coaches or entrepreneurs, think about your LinkedIn profile, not as a CV, but as a website. The fact you've worked for a company X is meaningless. Forget about what you did and highlight what you'd like to do now. And if you do that, you're, you're likelier to become a magnet for the sort of clients you'd like to work with. Good stuff. Daniel, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Plus.